Welcome back to another edition of Conversations Different, a podcast from the Santa Fe New Mexican featuring interesting people from Santa Fe and northern New Mexico. I'm your host, Inez Russell Gomez, and with me today is Archbishop John Wester, 12th Archbishop of Santa Fe. As the shepherd of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Santa Fe, he leads his flock on spiritual matters, but also speaks out on the issues that touch on moral principles, whether immigration, abortion, fair wages, or the death penalty. Recently, Archbishop Wester returned from a trip to Japan, where he traveled to bear witness to the after-effects of nuclear weapons as he continues to push for verifiable nuclear disarmament across the globe. Welcome, Archbishop Wester. I wanted to start out by talking about your appointment here. When you came to the Archdiocese back in 2015, was the legacy of the Manhattan Project and the development of nuclear weapons something that was even in the forefront of your mind? Interesting question, Inez. No, it was not. I didn't even think about it. I didn't know there was a Los Alamos National Laboratory or Sandia National Laboratory. I just didn't know about it. I knew there was a Los Alamos, but I didn't. I knew there was a Manhattan Project, but I just didn't put the two together. So, no, I didn't really think of it. Yeah. So what brought you to that realization that this was the place where the bomb was made and then where it was tested and where today we still have scientific laboratories that are building weapons? Well, basically, um, I think what it was in 2017, I went to Japan and with two bishop friends of mine. And uh, it was a vacation, basically. But we did, you know, kind of take time out of our vacation to go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that was a very sobering experience, seeing, going through the museums and seeing the f- photos, etc. Then I came back here to Santa Fe, and some friends came by, and I took them to some of our museums here. And I saw the Manhattan Project as it was displayed there in the museum downstairs. It was very interesting. And all of a sudden it hit me. I said, wow, I'm here where it began. Mm-hmm. And I've already seen what happened you know, as a result of the, to the two bombs. So it just got me to thinking about that, you know, Santa Fe plays a role in this whole issue of atomic weapons, obviously. And now with the Oppenheimer movie just coming out, it's really even more in in people's uh, thoughts. So then I gave a talk at the Roundhouse on um, on nuclear disarmament and peace. And, you know, I'm asked to give a talk on different things, and I did. And I, I, I meant it. I mean, it was, but I'm not an expert on it at all. And then I met a fellow named Jay Coglin, who was at the uh, in the audience, and um, he introduced himself to me. And I said to myself, "Oh, here's one of those radicals, you know, one of those yes. radicals, an activist, an activist. I'm a, I'm talking <laughs> to a real activist." And um, I told him later we've become very good friends. And I I said to him later, I, said, I told him that, and I said, "Well, he said you weren't far off the mark there, John." <laughs> so, yeah. But he got me interested in this whole subject, and uh, my staff and I, Ann Avalon, who's the head of our Department of Peace and Justice, and Leslie Radigan, who's in charge of our communications, we started talking, and one thing led to another, and I just felt drawn to this talk. I think that the, as Archbishop of the Catholic Archbishop of Santa Fe, that our archdiocese needs to be part of this conversation that will lead, hopefully, please God, to ending nuclear arms in our world. Yeah. That's an incredible goal. It's it's almost overwhelming to think about it as a goal, considering you've got the worry about Russia using uh, weapons, nuclear weapons in Ukraine and in, in their invasion. And now we have plutonium pit production expanding. And, and to be clear, they're not building weapons right now at Los Alamos. It's it's the brains behind the weaponry and keeping the, the nuclear bombs, you know, supposedly safe. Mm-hmm. Um, and it I guess the nuclear... Armageddon clock or whatever is as close to possibly going off as ever. So how do you keep your hope alive that we can move to a better place? Well, I think it's, it's to me, it's two layer, two, what would I say, two tracks. One is the recognition of where we are today. You're correct, Inez, that uh, President Putin, you know, rattles his nuclear saber from time to time or has someone else do it. And even though nuclear weapons haven't been used yet in the nuclear, the Ukraine war, which is extraordinarily sad, nonetheless, they are being used in a sense as the threat, you know, and it yeah. keeps everybody at bay and what to do, it's wringing our hands, etc. 
And so, um, so there is the reality of today, and I recognize that we have to be realistic. Nobody, we're certainly, the, when we wrote the pastoral letter, had, it was not calling for unilateral disarmament, not at all. We're calling for a conversation that will ultimately lead to multilateral, verifiable nuclear disarmament. And so, and we believe that the labs, Lanel and Sandia and Lawrence Livermore in California, will still be very much alive as they produce technology and make sure that it is verifiable. But that second track that I'm talking about is how do we face the reality of today and at the same time have a comprehensive conversation and engagement that leads toward a day when we can get rid of nuclear weapons. So we have to do the two at the same time. Now, you referenced your pastoral letter, Living in the Light of Christ's Peace. What is a pastoral letter in terms of, you know, the Catholic Church as opposed to, you know, the bishop speaks out kind of thing? It seems like it would have more weight. That's right. A pastoral letter does have more weight, and I called it that on purpose because it would be the same thing really as uh, St. Paul or, or Timothy or St. John or St. Jude or St. Peter or St. James writing a letter to their faithful. It's a pastoral letter. Now, obviously, it's not part of the Bible, but it's, <laughs> but it's, I'm not, you know, saying yeah. that, obviously, but, but it's the same idea. And so it's the, a, a bishop, you know, to, a pastor of a diocese uh, giving a letter of, of importance and saying that this is important for all of us and to really engage this for those who work at Lanel and Sandia, for those who don't, for those who do anything in between, for all of us, because we all have a stake in this conversation. Because frankly, without wanting to be a fear mongerer, if worse comes to worse and we do have a nuclear exchange or a nuclear Armageddon, we won't be around. It'll be the end of it because the, the, the powerful weapons we have today are just so much different than they were, you know, almost 78 years ago. I guess we'd all go to heaven sooner. Well, that's true. You know, the, the bright Please, side. Please, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he wouldn't be happy with us because I think one of the, the chief goal of instructions in the Bible is to take care of his creation and his kingdom, mm-hmm. which is, is one of the, the jobs we probably as humans are not doing too well at right now. That's right. And this, and I think this nuclear question does um, touch on Laudato Si, which was Pope Francis's uh, encyclical, to be shepherd, to be caretakers of, of, of our Mother Earth, of our common home. And, and, of course, nuclear weapons have the capacity to wipe out all of civilization, to plunge the whole, uh, whole Earth into a nuclear uh, arm, uh, winter, which scientists tell us would last probably about 10 years. Most people would die not of the nuclear blast uh, immediately if they're at the hypocenter, nor of radiation, but most would die of starvation in the ensuing years because there'd be no vegetation, no animal life, no sunlight. And people would, uh, if you read The Road by Carmack McCarthy, it's a rather, he was the same one that wrote uh, No Country for um, Dead Men, or I think. But he... um, Old men. Old men. Sorry about that. Uh, Santa Fe resident. (laughs) Oh, that's right. Yeah, Yeah. he just passed away. He passed away, yeah. Yeah. But that book is very, very startling, very scary. Yes. But he kind of fictionalizes what would it be like, and uh, it would not be pretty. Oh, that's awful. This is a, a terrifying place to take a break. We'll be right back with Archbishop John Wester. Thanks, Inez. This is Patrick Dorsey, publisher of the Santa Fe New Mexican. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Conversations Different with Inez Russell Gomez. Great local content is only possible with a talented staff dedicated to bringing you the best local content possible. For that staff to do its work, we need your support by subscribing to the Santa Fe New Mexican. If you're already a subscriber, thank you. And if not, there's never been a better time to subscribe. In addition to our home-delivered newspaper that comes with full digital access, we also provide digital-only subscriptions for SantaFeNewMexican.com. We'll also be releasing more online-only audio and video programming moving forward. The Santa Fe New Mexican has been here for nearly 175 years, and we want to continue being your source for local news and information. Visit us at SantaFeNewMexican.com slash subscribe or call us at 505-986-3010. Thank you. It's a new day in New Mexico, and the doors to boundless opportunity are open as tens of thousands of New Mexicans reach higher 
to pursue a dream, broaden their horizons, and retrain for a better job. With the New Mexico Lottery and Opportunity Scholarships, you could build yourself a better future anywhere in the state. You put in the hard work, we'll help with the costs. For eligibility details, visit ReachHireNM.com. We are back with Archbishop John Wester, who has been outspoken in calling for discussions on nuclear nonproliferation, one of the large issues in our world. And one thing I found interesting in reading other interviews you've given um, is that so many Catholics don't realize that Pope Francis has said nuclear weapons are immoral, that deterrence no longer is really a legitimate strategy. That's a good point, Inez, that you bring up, and it really changed the moral needle for us Catholics, and we believe for all of us. The, in 1983, the Catholic bishops of the United States put out a pastoral letter on peace, a peace pastoral it's called, and in that they said that there was a place for deterrence, that you could have nuclear weapons for deterrence. It's interesting to note that the United States and Russia, uh, these major superpowers, have never had only deterrence in mind. Because if they did, we wouldn't need the thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons we have. We'd only need about 50 to 100 or so, whatever. And plus, the weapons today are so much more powerful than, than fat man and little boy. Uh, but the Pope, when he said that in, in, in Hiroshima in 2019, it just really was it was a huge seismic shift in moral theology for the Catholic Church, that even possessing a nuclear weapon is immoral, cognizant of how, how dangerous they are, how destructive they are. I don't mean to have these puns, but it blows away all of the just war theories. There's no way you can be in, in a discriminate, that you can avoid a civilian casualties, that you can be uh, proportional in the means used to respond to your attack, whatever. The, all, those, all those points of, of the just war theory go out the window. Uh, nuclear weapons are just way too powerful. Uh, you're, you're dealing with, if you want to use the mythical language, we're dealing with the, the power of the gods, the Greek gods, you know, the Roman gods. These are, we human beings are fallible and vulnerable. We make mistakes. We know of many uh, 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 near accidents here in, Al uh, here in Santa Fe, but down in Albuquerque, a bomb was even dropped accidentally. So clearly the Pope has changed the moral uh, landscape. And so now uh, what he's saying is, okay, everybody, nuclear weapons are immoral. What are we going to do about it? Do yeah. we just uh, just status quo and say, okay, we just got to keep making more and more uh, nuclear weapons forever? Or do we say, no, we cannot live with them. We've got to get rid of them. That's a fascinating point. And you think about there's been so much emphasis on President Joe Biden, you know, who is everyone knows a Catholic how he shouldn't go to communion because he supports that abortion should be legal. But nobody has come and said the United States has this huge stockpile of nuclear weapons. As a Catholic president, he should be leading more conversations to rein them in. That's right. And we would like to get Mr. Biden uh, to live out what he has spoken about in his in his past, uh, as vice president, as senator, he's been very clear that we need to move toward nuclear disarmament. And I hope he still is. I know that he's, I wouldn't want his job for all the money in the world, but he's got a tough job. But we need to push our political leaders to show leadership and to say, look, we need to do something about this. We're, we're not, Again, we're not calling for unilateral disarmament. We know that we've got uh, you know, the situation you mentioned, Inez, in Ukraine, we've got China, which wants to have nuclear parity. I think it's by 2035. We know that we've got the Iran situation, Pakistan, India have nuclear arms, North Korea, has, they, they rattle that, their saber, what they're doing. It's just, a terrorist could get in touch with the bomb, an accident could happen, a misunderstanding. Now artificial intelligence is getting into the game. They're introducing into artificial intelligence into our nuclear arsenals as well as hypersonic delivery systems. So the bombs are more powerful, the delivery systems are quicker, the artificial intelligence is in there. This is a, a perfect storm for an error or miscommunication, which would be fatal for all of us. Oh, that's just such a comforting thought. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate to be talking about such... You feel like a skunk at a lawn party. <laughs> I got a... I went to graduate school uh, back in the 80s when Mikhail Gorbachev came to Washington to see Ronald Reagan. And uh, for some reason, my 
professor told me I had to do my paper on nuclear nonproliferation. So that was my graduate mm. school journalism thesis. And I remember, you know, people were somewhat hopeful that we had reached a point where we had contained it. It wasn't spreading to other countries. And maybe things would be a little better, especially because the Soviet Union and the United States were talking. And, you know, as we saw, the Soviet Union then broke up. And it seems like we've come such a far place from that hopeful moment. Mm -hmm. And and how do we go back to kind of refocus on what we need to do as human beings, which is reduce the risk of blowing up the planet? Right. And I, you bring up a good point, Inez, you know. I hope uh, our, our, your listeners would um, Google and get the President Kennedy's so-called peace speech of 1963. Uh, he gave a speech at the um, American University, and that was my school. That was your well. It yeah. was wonderful, and and we had he was a great leader in my view. And Khrushchev was in Russia. Khrushchev had his speech printed and passed it out to some of his main uh, uh, deputies. But Pope John the Twenty, Saint John Twenty Third, was in the Vatican. We made progress since those days. And, and he, the President Kennedy said, don't look at Russian people as our enemy. They're good people. Yeah. We always demonize people or we dehumanize them. And then that gives us permission to go and, and blast them to smithereens. We have to realize that God, we are all God's children. And God wants us to get along with each other, to be in, living in harmony. It, it, yes, we're not, we're, we have uh, different views, different backgrounds and all that. But we don't have to be you know, all lockstep the same. We can have unity with diversity. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to go back to those days and, and, and really press our leaders that we want peace and we want you to work for it. And we don't want this to be something like frosting on the cake. These, are, these issues are way too urgent. I think we need to get people to really, we're going to have at the end of November, the TPNW, they call it, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The Vatican was the first to sign it. And about 200 plus countries signed it, those who do not have nuclear weapons. And they they signed the agreement to the TPNW to not develop nuclear weapons. And the idea was that the nuclear powers would sign a treaty, the treaty to get rid of their nuclear weapons. None, to my, to my knowledge, uh, maybe a listener will correct me if I'm wrong, none of the nuclear states have signed the TPNW. We need to get them to sign it to work toward nuclear disarmament. Again, recognizing that we've got to get through these, you know, it's going to be stages, it's going to be done in, in steps. And we have to do it prudently and, and, and wisely, but we have to do it. And, and we have to convert our labs. We want to retain those jobs, which will be retained, in my view, and to peacemaking instead of war making. Yeah. And it seems like the labs have a lot to do to stop the planet from overheating. Like they That's have, right. There's important work that could be done quickly. A good point. A very yeah. good point. And you know what, Inez? It's always the poor that suffer first and the most. And all these things, climate change, fires, floods, uh, winds, it's always the poor that, that suffer the most in these things. And so we really need to, to, to do something about it. And, 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 act, and even what we're doing now, my fear is the industrial military complex is so rich and so powerful that there's not that will to change. You know, we're, for example, at Nano now, we're, we're redoing the pit cores, but there's no need to do that. That's going to be extremely expensive. It's going to create nuclear weapons that have not been tested. So what are we going to do? You know, violate those treaties as well and start doing atmospheric testing or what? I don't know. And so it's scary to me that, you know, we, it cannot be nuclear arms forever. We have to realize we've got to have the will and the impetus to do away with them and, and, and we've done a lot. We've gone to the moon. We've got, we've got medically, our, we've done great things in our world. We've got to keep doing it. This is a challenge, and we've got to face up to it. And that's a good place to take a break. We'll be right back with Archbishop John Wester. My name is Maria Jose Rodriguez Cadiz, and I am the Executive Director with Solace Sexual Assault Services. Our mission is to prevent sexual violence and empower survivors of sexual violence through restoring dignity, strength, and resiliency. For almost 51 years, Solace has reduced the impact of sexual violence. We do it by focusing on human rights, social justice, hope, and dignity. We believe survivors are experts in their own experiences and acknowledge that empowering them is crucial to their healing. 
Our advocacy, forensic interviewing, and therapy services are centered to their needs. Our sexual violence prevention programs in schools and community is just as important. Please check our website at findsolace.org. And if in need, you can call our 24-7 hotline, which is 800-721-7273. Your support is crucial to the lives of survivors. Thank you. Gracias. So this summer, there was a really lovely meeting of interfaith groups uh, at Santa Maria de la Paz in July on the anniversary of the Trinity and, and one of the many spills that there have been to talk about, you know, how to get people moving so that rather than this being a conversation, it becomes action. Mm-hmm. How did that all come about? And, and how did you leave after you, you know, went through it? How did you feel? I was very, very pleased with that. We, it was the July 16th uh, event right. there at Maria La Paz, and we had, it was an interfaith event. We had civic and officials there. Mayor Weber was there and others representing political uh, leaders. And we had religious leaders. Uh, we had Tina Cordova from the Tularosa Downwinders Consortium, which, by the way, was great news. We're hearing there's finally some movement there. The federal government is recognizing the Downwinders and all the harm that's been done here in New Mexico to New Mexicans by nuclear uh, accidents and fallout and spills and a lack of proper cleanup, etc. So. Um, that was a wonderful prayer service, and it was meant to, on the on the anniversary of the Trinity test site, um, to talk about the importance of praying for peace and praying for nuclear disarmament. So um, this is, again, why New Mexico needs to be so much a real part of this conversation, because we have such a, a history with nuclear weapons, and we have to, if for us to speak about it, people listen. They right. realize that we have a we have a stake in this, and for for a state in which the nuclear weapons have been created and developed and continue to be, uh, when 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 you know when 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 Ian Hutton, Hutton was that E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. When New Mexico speaks, people listen. And so I don't know if I'm allowed to give free advertisement on the radio, but anyway, um, that's important for us New Mexicans to be speaking about this. So I think it was a very powerful prayer service. And it gives me, you know, again, and as as a person of faith, and so many of us are, I think that uh, it gives us, you know, we need God's help in this. And even if people have no faith, you know, we need to come together as human beings and support one another in this important cause. Makes sense. And and I, I know that not only were we the place where the bomb was developed, we have become the place where everyone's going to dump their nuclear waste. So we really have a stake be above and beyond probably most of the country. That's right. And, and that's huge. Now, after you finished your the prayer service, you uh, went back to Japan. And I'd like to talk, have you talk mm. about what you saw there and, and how it left you feeling. I think I love that we visited with Bishop Shirahama from uh, Hiroshima and Archbishop Nakamura, the present Archbishop of Nagasaki, and then Archbishop Emeritus Takami. They're just tremendous, tremendous uh, bishops, and they're just wonderful men. We had a wonderful uh, meeting with them, Archbishop Aitchin and I, Archbishop Aitchin of Seattle, where he has the Trident submarines, Ohio-class Trident submarines. And we went with our staffs, and we just had a great visit. We became partners. The four dioceses are now partners working for peace and nuclear disarmament. We're going to have uh, scheduled masses well, you know, at the same time in Japan and the United States. We're going to try to see if we can heighten an awareness, in their case, of the, um, of the uh, uh, Kabukisha those who were part of the bombing, who survived the bomb, and in our case, the um, downwinders that have been been harmed with cancer and other ailments and other d- serious diseases and fatal diseases from the uh, from the nuclear uh, fallout. So this is going to be something I think is very powerful. For me, whenever I go there, I just see the human devastation what those people suffered. You know, I'm reading, I just finished reading The Bells of Nagasaki by Dr. Nagai, Takashi Nagai, and it's just so uh, such an, a riveting book because he was actually, you know, he was 
very near the hypo center. His wife died. He was, she was vaporized basically oh, in, in the blast in horrible. Nagasaki. And so seeing what they said, seeing that human suffering, there's just a natural human response. We can't let this happen. This is just not right. You know, get, prescinding from all the discussions, I know those are controversy. Should we or should we not have dropped the bomb in 1945? This prescinds from that, that morally speaking, to cause such rampant, indiscriminate human suffering that goes on today, people are still suffering from that, is just wrong. And that's, we've got to do something about this. And, 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 of course, it calls the question, you know, not just nuclear arms, but all arms. We've got to learn how to live together in peace and to start to let diplomacy be the, what decides our, our fate, not uh, bombs and, and killing people. So for me, the Japan experience, I admire greatly the Japanese uh, resolve. They, you know, when I was there, you read in a guy's books, you know, he said clearly, he said, we're all at fault here. Every side, the Russians, the Japanese, the United States, the Germans, all of us have done something historically that we can be ashamed of and that we need to seek forgiveness for. I, I think we know as we look at today's controversies in the world that, you know, blaming each other, it's just, it's a blame game that never ends. You know, when, do, when right. does it end? Go, who, there's always a grievance. Some, somewhere, some, somebody has to say, stop, take the high road. I ask for your forgiveness. Let's together, live together in peace. And that's what we're looking for. And that's what Japan reminds me of. It's a symbol. When I see that beautiful symbol, the prime minister was there in the Hiroshima memorial ceremony. And uh, it was very striking how they're, they're calling for peace, you know. And so we call the prime minister of Japan to really work on that and not to move toward nuclear arms or to seek protection from them, but to really move toward signing the TPNW and to, get, and to move, getting rid of nuclear weapons. That's a, an amazing goal. Uh, what do individuals, what can we do as people, what, what should parishes be doing when you move into the Catholic world? What do people do to make this a reality instead of a goal? I think what we can do is to, re, to, to pray. I think what we do is to educate ourselves, and we can come to realize the situation that we have here, that it's really... I think, like you brought out rather clearly, and I have to admit you were right, Inez, I didn't come here with that thought. I mean, I was, I was lulled in a sense of self-complacency, a false sense of complacency when I came here. I haven't thought about nuclear weapons since 1962. Wow. When I, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I think we need to educate ourselves. We need to really get the word out that we have to do something about it. I remember, I don't have time to say this, but there was a, a, an Easter, one priest, you know, the, the, the priest said, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, it's Easter. And the little girl for you says, Mommy, did you know that? And the mother said, Yes, dear, of course I did. Be quiet. She says, You knew it? Well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> and the priest said, well, there's my homily. Go out and tell people the Lord is risen. Well, this is the same thing. Go out and tell people these nuclear weapons are dangerous. They're going to kill us. They're going to destroy us. They're going to end civilization. we got to get the word out. I don't think people realize the situation we're in and how close we are. Putin, uh, in a perverse kind of way, has, I think, given us more of a sense of the danger we're in. Right. But what do we do? We run right back to our caves, to our little, little safe little spaces and don't want to think about it. Well, as hard as it is, we have to think about it. We have to do something about it now before it's too late. Yeah. It's really hard to pull back in the culture and the climate we're in, too, because if you're at all peace-like as a, as a national politician, you're soft. You know, we have candidates for president who believe that we should be shooting immigrants at the border and pretending they're killing cartels. And it's like, if we're not, you know, super macho, violent, and out to protect, you know, with first strikes as opposed to reaction, we're not really, you know, Americans anymore. And I don't know how we move back from that to saying, you know, the true strength is to live in peace and to spend our money on butter and not guns, you know, to use the old economic mm -hmm. argument. Well said, Inez. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King said, you know, hate can't conquer hate, only love can do that. Oh, yeah. All these weapons, nuclear, otherwise, they're weapons of hate. Yeah. And, and a lot of times even our economies, you know, oppress people too. We've got it, you know, St. Francis de Sales said, there's nothing as gentle as real strength and nothing as strong as true gentleness. Oh. And so I think if we could start to, to really live that out, we'd realize that love is far stronger than nuclear weapons. We need to live in peace. Oh, that's beautiful. And we will end right there. Thank you so much, Archbishop. Oh, you're welcome. It has well, been a real you. pleasure. 